All righty, guys. Hey, happy Monday. Hope you're doing well. Hope you had a great weekend. And again, I hope you had great holidays. And now those are behind us and it's time to get busy with our dogs. New year, new resolution. Man, we are motivated. We are ready to go. One of the things that I want to talk about today is there's a lot of confusion surrounding use of particular types of equipment to create certain types of behavior. Uh, for example, a slip lead here. This is a compression type leash. What it does, you, you put it around your dog's neck, it slides down, then you slide the little leather tab till it's snug on the neck. There's a difference between shape and a behavior with a slip collar or even a prong collar for in all actuality and a slip lead versus correcting with it. And that can be a little bit of not knowing the difference in the two is a stumbling block for many owners. I cannot tell you, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, aren't you choking the dog when I'm pulling up on the leash, when I'm shaping a set? Man, I tell you what, I would be a, a massive millionaire by now. There's, I understand it. It's the natural apprehension that comes with anything around our necks because we are forevermore anthropomorphizers. We're always going to impute our human qualities, our human feelings, our emotions into our dogs, into the evolutionary sharpshooter called the dog. Again, I've, I've done many videos on this, so go back on our YouTube page and watch those videos. But the neck on your dog, first and foremost, is like a thigh muscle. It's a very powerful muscle. It's attached to very powerful jaws that are connected to very long fangs. If we did not have arms, and we had to capture animals and kill them to eat using just our mouths. If we had to carry our children for miles and miles with just our mouths, imagine how strong our necks would have to be to facilitate all of those actions. So by putting a slip leash around the dog, when you're first shaping the behavior, for example, the sit, when you're first shaping it, all you're trying to do is pull the head upward. That's all you're trying to do. In the beginning with young puppies, we do that through luring. You take any young dog and even an older dog. First of all, they got to they gotta want the treat. If they don't want the treat at all, then forget the step. But if they do, of course, dog's head is here. We give it a, put a treat right from its nose. We lift it. The nose follows because the dog wants a treat. And guess what? When the head goes up, guess what goes down? The butt. Just like you going off a diving board. You go off a diving board and you look too far down at that water, guess where your butt's going? Right over your head and you're going to do a back buster depending upon the height of the diving board and the water. It's just physics. It's just good old mechanics 101. Wolves don't have to raise their heads but a few inches to sit. They'll pull their hind legs right up underneath them and then form that sit. But, you know, mankind's been messing with dogs for a long time. And the anatomical structure of the dogs has changed greatly. And many dogs do have to lift their torso, their chest area, more than two to three inches above their hind legs to create a sit. We're just doing that for them. Because we're coming up to them and we're saying this word, hey, dog, sit. And, of course, if the dog's never heard the word sit before, again, back on my good old semiotics, we've got a triangle here that's not even formed. It's just dots. So here comes the signal, sit. And again, there's no interpret it. I can't interpret that because I never heard that in my life. So what are you going to do? You're left at trying to make this animal form a sit. So again, you can lure the dog, but at some point, that luring becomes part of the signal. Now you have a hand. Now you have a treat. Now you have your posture. You have many things. You have the word set, an auditory, auditory, visual. Again, visual, and it can be also what's called an unconditioned stimulus because it's just food. And then you have your posture, another visual. Well, now dogs learn from their eyes and touch. So let's throw in a haptic while we're at it because at some point, if you don't, this is known as a signal suite. And for the dog to be able to interpret the sit, if you use these all the time, all of these will have to be present. They will always have to be present. So again, most of us, we don't want a dog that we have to lure into a sit every single time. When we're walking a dog, we'd rather the dog just sit when we come to a stop. That's really handy. And it's a really, really strong and powerful goal 
to set for yourself and your dog in the new year if you got a new dog. Okay, so all that being said, at some point we need to introduce a haptic. And I'm just going to write haptic here. And we're going to do that by using the slip collar. Sorry, guys, I hope you can read going from the bottom up because I'm running out of room. <laughs> okay, so we're going to use a slip collar and we're going to pull up on the dog's neck. Now, there is a huge difference between suggesting with a physical device. When you're doing this step here, you're trying to create the sit with the device for the first time and then trying to subsequently create the automatic sit for the first time. This does not serve as a correction even though you apply some pressure. It serves more as a non-escape type collar. Kind of like one of these martingales that are out there. It just keeps the dog from backing out of it, getting away from you. There is a lot of difference between me lifting your head using this device and, and applying just enough pressure to do so versus a correction, especially to a dog with a huge part of its anatomy that has 200 additional muscles surrounding all the important stuff versus your neck. A big difference. We're simply getting rid of the hand, taking the hand away, as far as in the treats away, and now we're going to introduce something else and we're going to bring it into my house, my single house called the sit house. And now that'll be just us sit and lift the head a little bit. And remember, we've already done some luring. We've already done this. The dog has an idea. In fact, the sit is now a solid line because sit means put my butt on the ground. Why do I know that? Because I have a reference. Brian's already lured me 200 times. He used the treat 200 times. The only thing between here, the referent and the signal, is called conceptual distance. Conceptual distance because I haven't done it yet with a slip collar. This triangle is never complete until you've used all the components. Until then, it's conceptual distance. And even once a dog does have this because I've been using the haptic signal of the slip collar, now if I try to create an automatic sit out of this room and I try to do it out there next to a soccer game going on, I have conceptual distance because I've never been made to sit around a bunch of kids playing soccer. A dog's response to any signal, its interpretation and further response and reference to any signal will always be dictated. Listen to these words. Always dictated by the conditions in which the signal and the response, the required response was presented to the dog. Under what conditions was it presented? If you're any time outside of those conditions, then you run the risk of having conceptual distance, confusion. I don't know. And that's where we ask ourselves, okay, now wait a minute. I know I taught you how to sit when I come to a stop, but you're not sitting. And then we want to impart this correction on the dog. No, we have to go build this thing first, this triangle under every condition, that you can imagine ever requiring your dog to sit next to you. So in the beginning, this is just a tool. I want to get my hand away. I want to get my treats away. I want to start really looking like I'm walking down the street. That's what I want to look like because you need to get to that point. So now when I stop, I lift the dog's head a little bit because when I lift that head, I form that sit. And of course, you can say sit, and probably should say sit in the beginning. Come to a stop, sit, lift the head, the butt falls. Immediately, there's no need for the haptic signal at that point any longer. So anything that pressure that you use to lift the head, take it away. Reward your dog. Reward with an audible praise. Good job. Well done. Don't always give a treat. Sometimes you do you switch to a variable reinforcement. But the biggest point I want to make, lifting a dog's head with a slip leash in the beginning, if it's done correctly, is nowhere near a correction. Corrections start to come only when the triangle is solid under that very condition. Now all of a sudden, you don't sit. Okay, well we need to grow this thing just a little bit here, just so you know, I get it. I've trained you to sit automatically when I come to a stop around a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of dogs. But today, that dog is fluffier than all the rest of the other dogs. But close enough. 
Close enough. So now, hey, correction. So what a correction looks like on a slip collar is more sustained, firmer pressure. There's a difference between something being snug versus constricting. And when we start heading into constriction land is where we start heading into correction land. That's where a cost now comes in. And the animal goes, okay, excuse me, that's getting a little tight. That's way beyond the teaching part of me. This is kind of in the I got to do it part. Yeah, you're right. It is. So I want you to go ahead and do it. And they do. And when they do it, the correction part, the constriction part goes away and they get a reward. Dogs are smart, much smarter than humans when it comes to cost benefit. Dogs don't repeat what they don't have success with. Only humans do that. We're the only species we know that does that. Here's why Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein wrote the definition of insanity. When you keep repeating the same darn thing over and over again, achieving the same results. They don't. They note it, note the self. I have to remember that because next time that comes along, I know how to avoid it. And that's what I do. I avoid it. But we use the leash to create in the first place. And then once the leash has been used over and over again, well, now that haptic signal can go away. You can actually make the slip collar go away. And the only thing that you're, you can even make the sit go away. And all that's left is you coming to a stop. And the dog now does an automatic sit. And I'm telling you, it just takes a lot of repetition under a lot of different conditions to create such a habit that I hope you're happy with it. A good example is a dog that I trained many years ago, a big, powerful Rottweiler. The owner wanted me to train this dog and get all these obedience titles on the dog, and I did. I got a CD, then a CDX, and then a UD from AKC on this particular dog. And in all of those, when you come to a stop, your dog had better sit and sit automatically without any input from you. Because if that judge sees you give that dog any input, that's it. Gee, big old check mark on the old clipboard. And you don't want to hear that pencil ever on that clipboard. Because now you're losing a lot of points. So I did all that. Yay! I was proud of myself. Like, thank goodness, thank goodness, thank goodness. I got this done. Next request. Oh, now I'd like to show my dog in confirmation. Oh, no. Why? Because you can't sit automatically in confirmation. When you come to a stop, you have to stand. Do you know how much work it now took? Because all these went away. All I had to do was quit moving and the dog would sit automatically without a thought. The dog never even gave the thought. You hear the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? That's what you're dealing with, procedural memory. It's why you can text and drive, even though you shouldn't. It's why you can multitask. Because we're doing things from procedures over and over again. We do it like an instinct. And that's where that goes. Lure, lure doesn't work. Go to slip, leash, slip, leash will work. And you build it. If luring does work, use that to a certain point where you're creating that condition, then take it away because otherwise the hand will always have to be there or the treat will always have to be there and you better hope the treat works all the time and that's not going to happen. Okay, so now what I'd like to do, Jake, can we borrow? Absolutely. Layla? Yes. All right, so we have a little female, beautiful Princess Layla. There we go. And now, that, did you just see that? Jake, would you do that again? You went too fast for me, but I know you're operating off of instinct. Jake is operating off of instinct. Okay, so Jake, now think. Okay, so Jake's got Layla up on her feet. Now, he's just going to suggestively pull up on that leash. There you go. No big deal. That was not a correction in any shape, form, or fashion. It was not. We're doing this on the most powerful appendage that dog has. We're simply making a suggestion by pulling the head up. So as you progress along, you're wanting to train the automatic sit. Here's what it looks like. Jake will give the command to heal. He's walking the dog. Okay, now turn around, Jake. And now when he comes to a stop, he'll say sit and give a suggestion. Bingo. There we go. And then, of course, a reward follows up from there. Do it again, Jake, please. Heel. Heel is the command. Sit. Comes to a stop, says sit, and then gives the suggestive haptic pressure upward. Now, we're going to fast forward. Fast forward here a little bit. 
Now Jake will come to a stop. He will take away the word sit. Remove that auditory signal. Remove it. And now just give the haptic signal lifting up the head. There we go. And then over time and under all the conditions in which we will need this dog to respond, not even the haptic signal will be required. Are we there yet, Jake? Yeah, we'll, we'll do a shot here. A Let's give it a shot here. This is a new dog in training, so let's just take a look. See where we are. Hey, hey, hey all right. Okay, so we, we got that. Well done. Way to go. Far from finished. Because let's see if that will happen out on the boulevard out there. Let's see if that happens when someone walks in your door. Let's see if that happens if another dog comes walking by. That's what I'm talking about. Once you finish all of this stuff here, now you work on under what condition will the dog do it. Because any dog's reliable response to any command will be dictated, always dictated by the conditions in which the command was trained. Always keep that in your head. Go write that on a post-it note, stick it on your mirror, and when you brush your teeth in the morning, you read that back to yourself. Because that's the absolute truth. It's the same with humans. Again, so if you don't buy it with the dog thing, buy it from yourself. It's the truth. Okay, guys, so to wrap this thing up here, just real quick, there is a difference between a correction. We're not going to correct Layla because she did right. We're still in the teaching mode. We're in the shaping mode. We're in the suggestive mode. We're simply using a tool that can correct, but it can also just suggest. And it's one she can't back out of because we are working on these conditions and we do go outside and there's a big old world out there and we don't want her to get away from us and you don't want your dog to get away from you. So again, it's just suggestion. Hey, if I lift your head up, your butt will go to the ground. And when it does, magical things happen. And even if I have to graduate to a correction, we obey nature's rule. We start as light as possible. We use the lowest amount of correction possible to immediately stop the undesired behavior, promote the desired behavior. For some dogs, that can just be what I would feel like a suggestion. Other times, it is a correction. But then they learn. And once they learn, all of that stuff goes away. Corrections go away. Any haptic signal goes away. You're left with only one thing. You come until stop. And I hope you like it because that's what you're going to get. And now you have to live with it because changing that is going to be really difficult. Anytime you try to force anything out of procedural land into and down the channels of explicit land, you're going to be a lot. You got your work cut out for you. Okay, so I hope that clears that up. Guys, when using a slip collar, it is not always a correction tool. Even the same thing with a prong. If you're using a prong collar, no. Those necks are powerful. Powerful. Again, I stood there and watched my veterinarians cut into necks. And I'm here to tell you, they would always just go, oh, why? A lot of muscle. A lot of sinewy to get through. So they just go, oh, gosh, we have to do this. Yeah, it's incredible. So suggest, teach, shape. And then start to build the conditions in which I need you to do all that shaping, teaching, suggesting. And then slowly but surely, we start taking away the suggestion. We start taking away the teaching. All that. We just now started waiting to see, what are you going to do? How will you respond when I stop now? Out here where the whole wide world is versus yesterday where there was nothing. And you learn from it. And you get that feedback. And when you get that feedback, you write it down. Okay, so note to self. Under these conditions, not so good. Under these conditions, really good. And you learn from it. And you just keep pushing that envelope, always pushing it. Pushing it. Never overstressing yourself, never overstressing the dog. But you're pushing that envelope. Good stress. The healthy stress. The learning stress. So, guys, uh, long video. But a really important point, because so many people shy away from using a device like this. They want to use a buckle collar or a flat collar, and it's, it, they can't even lift the head with it. The dog immediately starts thrashing around, looking over here, trying to back out of it, doing whatever. This stops all that. It stops it. But it's not correcting in the sense that, hey, bad dog. No, 
is, uh, you know what? If you just kind of sit there, I'll quit lifting. There you go. Good job. So again, it can be difficult to understand. I guess you just have to do it over and over and over again. But I'm here to tell you with all absolute sincerity that there is a big difference. Don't shy away from it. Don't shy away. Keep moving. Keep moving forward. Lift, 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 lift way beyond the point that you think you need to. Way beyond it. Way beyond it. We don't even test. I asked Jake to do this with Layla. But we don't even test like that until we have done what I told you to do a minimum of five to six hundred times over and over and over again. Building the Caruso habit. Then we can start going under conditions. Because now once I get to those conditions, the dog doesn't have to think about all the mechanical parts and all the moving parts associated with sit. That's an instinct. Now I have to think about why did I get that correction and then I immediately just do the behavior. I take away a lot of thinking. You don't have to think so much. Don't overthink it, dog. Just put your butt on the ground. We're good to go. That's when you do it too. They got this thing down. You got a solid triangle, baby. Then you move forward. And then keep on moving. You don't have to worry about the mechanics. Okay, guys, so that's it. Manic Monday. So you got a little bit of a manic video there. I just really want to make that point. If you have questions on it, drop them down in the thread. If I don't get to it, one of these guys to get to it, Evan Will, who's filming, Jake over here, he'll get to it. Someone want to get to it. We'll make sure that you guys are all cleared up on that uh, because, again, a very, very important step. Okay, that's it for today. So get busy. Get busy giving the haptic signal. Make sure you give all the other signals. This is called a signal suite. And then make sure you slowly but surely start to eliminate rooms in the home, rooms in the suite. Get rid of them. You don't need them all. You can just get down to just one. And that's it, guys. So I'll talk to you tomorrow. we got some more things to cover over. We've got a lot of look, some, some confusion out there right now with some training techniques. So I want to make sure I get them all cleared up here. Make sure you guys are good to go. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Layla. Thanks too, Jake. <laughs>